So I am so thrilled to welcome uh, you all today to our, uh, this is actually our fourth uh, storytelling session in our series. And um, I'm going to introduce Fu Young in just a minute, but just wanted to first um, introduce myself. My name is Megan Simmons, and I am the uh, Associate Director of Training and Design at ISKME. And our mission at ISKME is to improve the practice of continuous learning, collaboration, and change in education. And uh, we do that in a couple different ways. Most of you are probably familiar with our uh, initiative called OER Commons, which we launched in 2007. And it's a digital library that has uh, a wealth of, of resources for supporting open educational practice. And we also have tools for collaboration, uh, discovery, curation, authoring, and remixing of open educational resources. So that's, that's how we're involved in OER. And I uh, have been leading our education programs for our OER initiative for the past 10 years. And throughout our offering for our education programs, we always like to uh, have opportunities to keep the conversation going and showcase different voices of leaders who are doing great work. And as more and more states are thinking deeply around how they design for OER adoption, uh, we thought it would be a great thing to offer this session to folks to learn directly from these leaders that have been doing this for the past couple years. And so we just started talking to, to people that we admire and, and look up to that have been uh, doing this great work over the years and wanted to learn about how they got started in OER, how they determined their, their goals and priorities for their statewide work, and of course, how they addressed any challenges that they encountered. And so far in this series, we have heard from librarians, we've heard from state service agencies in Michigan, Iowa, and Pennsylvania. And today, we are so honored to hear the research and policy perspective on OER adoption from Bu Young Che. And she is the policy associate of e-learning and open education at the Washington State Board Community of for community and technical colleges. Um, and when I first spoke with Bu Young about being a storyteller, I just really loved her response. <laughs> I don't know if you remember Bu Young, but I was kind of talking about how we wanted, you know, a personal narrative on your journey. And she just jumped at it and said that she's really been craving an opportunity to share her experience, really taking on this work um, and really something that hadn't been done before and how she learned some hard lessons along the way <laughs> and found some really innovative solutions to challenges that came up. And we're really excited to hear from her and, and what she's done. I mean, we, when we were talking about everything that she's done in the state of Washington, we could literally you know, do five sessions just on, on her work. Um, but we'll, um, we'll get a chance to, to get uh, a, a good sense of, of what she's been doing and she has led the development of several OER initiatives, um, some you may know of, like the Open Course Library and the Open Washington Project. Uh, she also has co-authored uh, an OER research report, which was recently awarded the Open Education Consortium's Award for uh, Open Education Excellence. She was also invited by UNESCO to represent the U United States um, to write her chapter about their OER policy book uh, called Open Educational Resources, Policy, Cost, and Adoption. So she brings a lot of expertise and experience, and I think her perspective is so unique and powerful because she does come from this research and policy background but has some real on the ground experience and what it really takes to get an initiative rolling throughout the state. And they've had some really wonderful successes in the state of Washington. And I know many states are, are looking to Washington, not only from what they've done policy-wise, 
but also the, the various initiatives that they've successfully implemented uh, throughout the state. So uh, we're going to get a chance to hear from Bu Young and her, and her story of, of uh, OER adoption. And then uh, we'll have some time afterwards for discussion and to answer any questions that you all have. Uh, if there are questions that you have while she's sharing her story, please feel free to put them in chat and I'll be monitoring those and we'll make sure to cover all your questions once she's done. Uh, you're also welcome to, once you finish, to unmute your mic and, and, and ask you know, the questions yourself. But just to, for, for now, we'll have all the mics muted just to uh, limit some of the, the feedback that we get sometimes when we have a lot of people on, on the call. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Bu Young to, to take it away. And uh, we're just so grateful for you uh, for being here today, Bu Young. And uh, we can't wait to, to hear what you have to say. Awesome. Thank you. One second, let me share the screen. Um, Can you all see the screen that has a PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay, and can you hear me well? Yes. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because somebody else's office, I was worried. One second. <clears throat> so, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I think I have delivered so far about over 100 or so face-to-face -face OER workshops that teaches how to use OER and you know, all the technical aspects of OER. And I think I have trained over um, 2,000 faculty members uh, through our online OER training and that again teaches how to use and, and find the OER. But um, nobody has ever asked me to tell my story before. <laughs> So um, it, it's it's very new and special to me, and uh, hope that I can share something useful today with you and for you. So, um, in in in, in in prepping for this session, I asked myself what type of storytelling sessions were the most memorable kind for me in the past, and I remembered uh, those sessions where the speaker shared the really true and authentic stories with, with, with real examples, um, and because I could really relate to them, so um, that's what I will do today. I will really just tell a story, uh, nothing impressive, just all that um, weird things that I did. <laughs> and. Um, they are going to be mostly about my struggles and hard lessons um, that I got uh, through my six years of OER practice here at the State Board. And it was by no means a smooth ride, um, especially during the first couple of years. Um, my, uh, my struggle with OER <clears throat> started from the very beginning because I couldn't, I couldn't embrace the concept at all. I was extremely, I, I was just, extremely, extremely resistant to the idea. Um, and my participation was not even voluntary. I, I was forced to get involved in OER in 2010 because my system started the first statewide OER project called Open Course Library. And my boss uh, was the project director and they needed an extra instructional designer. So um, one day I was told that Boyong, you're going to join the instructional designer group for this project. And I said, all righty then. <laughs> That's how I started. Um, and um, as I joined the project, um, as I joined the project, I, I ended up going to a lot of project meetings and, and my resistance toward this idea of OER was growing bigger each time. I, I, I couldn't bear the concept. Um, it felt just so illogical uh, and forceful. Um, at that time, the climate um, within the agency was that was in a way that um, I should absolutely love this idea of OER to be part of the cool kids, um, but I, I couldn't bring myself to love it. And and mainly, may, that was mainly because I think. OER people kept saying that I should put my work out there for everyone to take. I mean, you know, I was trained for 10 years um, in the graduate school. 
um, to guard my intellectual property with my life. I mean, yeah, I, I spent years to develop one paper and the tears and torture, the blood that I endured to produce one intellectual property of my own. And now OER people are saying that I should give up my own works. And if I don't do that, I, I, I'm so uncool. So, oh, and then, um, and then, then director and the manager of the open course library, library project left the agency for another job. So <laughs> I became the project manager after that. So, um, you know, I didn't have a choice and I really had to teach myself and study the topic in depth. I, and, and, and then, and so I started reading, really um, studying this topic in depth and one day it hit me. I realized that, um, realize that, let me change the slide, uh, the openly licensing the work has really nothing to do with giving up my own work. You know, I, I used, I would still retain my copyright and my work is still under copyright protection. And as an author, I get to change the terms of use as I please. Um, and, and by openly licensing my, by openly licensing my work, I'm kind of declaring my ownership louder than ever, saying that this is really still mine. It's mine. But I like to share under my terms with you. So that piece of realization that open licensing is really about me, it's about me, and the copyright holder granting, it, it was just about copyright holder, me, granting broader rights to someone in advance, to the public in advance, so that they don't have to bother me. That simple understanding answered a lot of questions I had with OER and I felt so empowered and liberated um, and I become OER advocate from then on. So, but then, um, but then, you know, we have to think about why it took so long. Why it took so long for me to understand that simple idea. Um, you know, because before I attended number of OER workshops, but they were mostly about the rationale and philosophy of OER. Those workshops usually started with a story of a kid in Africa named Tonto and how OER will give a new hope to the kid and how OER would melt down the walls of academia, providing equality for everyone. And then usually they will show the rising cost of textbooks and matching statistics, the table and charts shows up. And then you hear five R's. And then elements of Creative Commons license appear. And then toward the end, you still don't know what it is. And I definitely don't know how to apply the all thing that you heard into your teaching. And you know, there one example. So shortly after I became the Open Course Library project manager, I actually attended a two-day boot camp, kind of boot OER workshop offered to the all college admins, deans, and VPs. And, and after two days of exciting and motivational speech uh, from a whole lot of people, at the end of the workshop, I remember some, some no, several participants saying, so how does that work? What is open licensing again? You know, so that it, it, so it, so that's that. Those were the moments that I realized um, that faculty support and professional development about around. Let me change the slide. So the faculty support and professional development around OER really has to be about discussing what open educational resources really are. Starting the conversation from the intellectual property to copyright to license to open license to the public domain and to the creative commons so the participants can logically connect those dots so it makes sense to them in their head. So, um, and for the how part, um, the detailed step by step instruction in finding, uh, using, and integrating open educational resources into your actual teaching practice is what faculty are actually looking for. Um, you know, philosophical conversation is important. It's really important. But to be honest, um, most faculty members that I've met and talked to, our system faculty members, they were philosophically already there. 
they care about our students' uh, 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 the educational costs more than me, and they have thought about that issue for years in their career. Um, before they ever knew about the concept of OER, they, they have made this commitment to reduce the cost of materials down by utilizing a whole lot of other available resources around. So really no need to tell them that, open up to the idea of open aid, otherwise you're uncool. Instead, tell them what it is and how to do it. And that's much better way to go. And to be honest, more respectful way to go. And then, um, and and this was um, um, this is another one of my misconception toward OER. So I thought um, the only drive for our faculty members who chose OER would be about um, saving students money, um, because all of the OER talks in out there started with this talk about rising costs for the commercial textbooks, but um, Based on the statewide research that I conducted in 2015 um, with 60 faculty members, um, there was another major benefit that was considered critical by our faculty members. And, um, and it was all about responsiveness, responsiveness of OER. And I will tell you what it is, what that means. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, during our 2000, uh, 15 study, um, we interviewed uh, 60 faculty members uh, and and those faculty members, a majority, majority of them stated that being able to update the content as needed is one of the most critical benefits that they have experienced in their use of OER. So they did those, so uh, it was not really just about money. Um, they said that the ability, the ability to modify update and revise uh, open education resources really did bring two very significant benefits in the classroom, in their classroom. And one was um, the presence of more current and evolving course content, and two, a more active student involvement in the creation of contents. So these faculty members, in, uh, many of them actually invited their students to be the co-author of the course content. So the course content was growing with the active participants from their students. And they also said that um, since they have different types of students each quarter, it's a community college, and, and then and what they said what worked in the preceding year, sometimes they don't work in the current year. Um, so they said that OER did help them adapt quickly to these differences and adjusting course content uh, uh, to, to be suitable. And, and then um, and faculty also, um, they also said, uh, they said that they also get to add real life examples to their curriculum. Um, um, they said that they use the latest events or the real data from uh, local sources um, to make their curriculum more applicable to their students' current employment situations, which is really critical. So, um, so that, so that, so learning that our faculty members appreciate OER from a whole new different angle was such a new finding that um, since then, um, when I, in, in designing the OER effort, um, I, I pay a lot more attention to this pedagogical and instructional side of the open educational resources. And faculty, to be honest, respond a lot better to those ideas than uh, cost saving. And then, um, so this was uh, one of the, the chart that was uh, produced out of this study. So if you're interested, um, you can go to the link that was, that's uh, on the slide. It's an open document that has 40 pages of finding out of this study and, and all the challenges and benefits that our faculty members shared through their exploration with open educational resources. And I, I, I think you will find the report pretty, uh, interesting, it's really easy to read. Um, um, and I used to think that um, the successful OER implementation really depends on the level of engagement 
uh, that an individual faculty member has with open educational resources. So all we have to do is convince one faculty at a time and, th and then grow a number and then reach a critical mass. That, that was what, it, what was in my head. But then um, through the statewide research and a whole lot of conversation I had with faculty members through the training, I learned that um, if not supported by the college and the department, it's really hard for the individual faculty member to sustain their effort. So uh, during the interviews, they mentioned that um, they really need a supporting climate in using OER, uh, first of all. Um, especially um, most part-time faculty members, they don't have any autonomy to decide on their, to decide their own course materials. And um, they will have to go with what was decided by the department committee. And sometimes they are allowed to use their own materials, uh, but they they wonder if it is actually a welcome welcoming thing. Is it actually uh, positively endorsed, or am I doing something out of what's recommended? Um, they also mentioned that uh, without setting up a proper partnership uh, with other parts of the school, and uh, um, and the um, end user of all this process, the students might not be able to properly benefit it of all this work. Uh, for example, I recently I heard this story. A professor A decided to go for, go for OER and adopted an open textbook. But in the school catalog, um, there was no marking or indication that Professor A's course used open educational resources. And of course, this was not communicated with uh, other school offices. And a student went to the school bookstore, waited in line for 20 minutes, um, and bookstore. And then, when it finally was his turn, the bookstore, um, who got no information about this, uh, simply told the students, "We have no book for you." What? We have no book for you, and, and you can imagine how stressed our students was. Um, so. Um, we think that students will have a much easier experience if the school catalog and online course schedule cl clearly mark the OER materials used and the school bookstore and school printing office was fully informed about this and the uh, um, school advising office, student services office and e-learning office and IT office were all properly communicated about this issue, reached reached the, and then and agreed on the school-wide policy around these issues and so the students will be able to uh, 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 will, will be able to benefit by this effort and our students will be able no our and we could and our faculty members will find the whole process easy and will be more motivated to continue with the effort so this is this the chart that you see on the slide is again the of one of the findings from the qualitative uh, investigation that we had in 2015. So again, uh, feel free to take a look. And then, um, this is the last, um, last piece of uh, my realizations. Uh, so finally, um, so I, I used to think that the key to sustainable OER is just funding. Um, it's, it's, it's just all about funding, which is still a very critical element for the successful OER project. You need money to, uh, there are a lot of occasions that you kind of need funding to start, the, 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 to start with. But over the years, I realized that um, I can achieve a much better sustainability by, by, oh, sorry. Um, by establishing and maintaining the, an infrastructure of support for the use of OER, you, you need a system. Um, so because I realized that the reason that some of the projects um, that I helped managing um, ha have a, ha had shorter lifespan after funding is over was because um, there was no supporting policy or framework or evaluation mechanism for further improvement. You know, this is, uh, lately I was attending one of the national open education related conference and there was this uh, uh, 
uh, school uh, college administrators who came to that event and shared his experience saying that our school just started open educational resources and we have 150 faculty members who adopted open educational resources what an achievement so you you know the, so that so um it was really proudly shared but then after the session was over i um asked this question to the presenter um what so what's uh, so do you have a supporting mechanism to uh, c do you have supporting mechanism for that effort do you have trained uh, uh, the supporting staff uh, do you have a, a matching policy or um, what is your uh, long-term plan with this um, how are you going to handle copyright issues plus uh, in, in, in and other uh, legal side of the uh, legal side of this work and then he didn't have and then I could tell that it was a shocking news for him that um, beyond a quick success of uh, a huge number of faculty adoption there was no plan and no uh, plan for further improvement so I that's um, that college's effort may go really well, but um, I think there may be a better chance for sustaining uh, that level of great success if there is a proper a supporting mechanism is offered and maintained properly. So, um, um, so, um, so now that, um, so after uh, having those experiences and realization um, now when there is an idea or opportunity uh, we make sure to check uh, where it fits in this picture this is uh, our infrastructure of support for system use of oer um, we make sure that um, this policy research and initiatives uh, are always integrated and uh, being the cohesive element to one another and supporting evidence and support um, so we um, so we make sure to check where it fits in the picture picture to see if we have valid data how it is connected to overall direction flow and policy will it inform our existing project or or will that contradict and then after all the consideration if idea turned out to be valid then we check if we could build a nice supporting framework before it is even designed um, so this helps us build more solid yet a flexible system for each individual project and therefore it sustains much much longer so <laughs> so that's the end of my uh, uh um storytelling today um i i hope it was fun and useful um do we go for a, a q a session or how do we do now <laughs> yes absolutely thank you so much um and i know People want to hear more about um, the, the different initiatives that you've done, but um, we had a question from Elena at Skagit Valley College in Washington, um, who uh, has asked if you could please clarify what you mean by easy and organized pathways to access OER. So, um, Elena, could you give me uh, some more context to your um, questions I, because i think i could go 100 different directions <laughs> to 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 address the question okay. um oh hang, hang on boy i'm going to go ahead and um can you hear us i can yes oh good we got the mic working. um that question was from uh claver uh -huh. so, um, hi <laughs> i'm gonna have him come on up to the mic and talk about that okay. so one of your slides i think like two or three slides back you had mentioned about that that's it this one uh, oh, yeah. yes okay. under professional development mm -hmm. the second tile is okay. Uh, yeah okay okay oh i see i see what you mean okay um so this was again this was one of the findings from our 2015 study and um so uh, a great number of faculty members commented when we asked uh, types of support they needed for their use of OER, they mentioned that we would like to have uh, a more integrated one-stop shopping place where 
all of the resources that I need to have to integrate open educational resources into teaching practice um, is available. So they, they, they said that they go to one page, one website where they could get some information about what open education resources are and go to the other website where they could see a list of qualified OER repositories and they go to, they have to go to a different website to get some copyright and legal advice about using OER and they have to go somewhere else to um, have um, to learn the news about OER development and they found this uh, they found uh, they found all these uh, resources being dispersed pretty confusing and time consuming and they they would love to have one place where they could have easy and organized pathway uh, to the use of open educational resources and that which was a motivation of us building open open Washington website in the first place so open Washington website has this um, section where you could learn everything about um, utilizing open education resources into your class from module one to module eight with uh, video modules and step-by-step -step instruction with screenshots and all, all those uh, detailed uh, descriptions and then uh, and there is another uh, menu on the website where you could check out all those uh, qualified repositories that offer quality open education resources and there is another Q&A part that gives you an advice on in terms of using OER uh, um, from from the legal sense so that's what we meant by <laughs> easy and organized pathways to OER yes so Boyang this is clever again I know <laughs> are you suggesting that the that one stop was sharp would be your uh, the Washington course library website. No, no, it would be open Washington, openwa.org. Yes. So is that the one stop for everything? Or do you suggest that each college should also have its own um, place like library where faculty will go to find information about everything they need about they need to know about OER? You know, I think that's actually a great uh, idea. And then to respond to some of those feedback which we have received in the past, we built um, Open OER Commons Hub, which is offered by OER Commons, um, which is a, a statewide repository where uh, the faculty members uh, from each discipline could gather uh, with the faculty members who teach the same subject and share resources and have communication, have conversation. So that place was uh, established uh, last year, but um, we haven't had um, like active promotion over the website. So we currently there is this space uh, established under OER Commons. And if you go to the OER Commons website and, and go to the hub, spaces and one of the hub you will see open Washington and that you will see uh, different spaces um, organized for each discipline so I hope that could be a beginning of uh, that could that could address some of those needs um, for for the space um, needed for the faculty members who teach same subject thank you awesome thanks Thank you. And um, I put the, the link to the hub in chat if folks want to go check that out. And I know we have some, some faculty from Washington on the call. So you're welcome to, to join the groups and, and get involved with the uh, collaboration sharing there. Um, Buyang, I, I know that you um, have done many different things in, in Washington, but I was wondering if you might be able to tell us uh, a little bit more around your uh, initiative to um, help uh, with the, the labeling and, and coding um, for, for OER. Uh, because I asked because I know there's faculty from other colleges uh, on here as well. And um, I've heard this from other colleges and how they're thinking about um, outreach and advocacy and engagement, not only with faculty across community colleges, but also students and how the labeling and, and coding of the courses can actually show the student demand and student interest for, for OER as well. Um, and I know that you've, you've done a lot of work with this, so it would be great just to hear 
a little bit more about how you all have, have thought about that and, and designed uh, for that in, in Washington. Sure. So in 2000, it, uh, so it, the st that story uh, started two years ago. So, um, so we have, so in the state of Washington and at the state board, we have a coding manual where, which is like a rule book. So it says how all of the courses offered uh, by the Washington's community and technical colleges uh, should be coded. So we have one code for an you know, online course, one code for hybrid course, and one code that for the courses associated with certain projects. So you get the idea. So those coding mechanism is used for the for the um, um, for for our for the data purpose, um, so that we we know how our what types of courses that are being offered in our system. So in 2015, we just added a new code um, that would mark the courses that use open educational resources. We just added the code to the coding manual, and after that code was added and then data alert was sent out to the system saying that you know we have this new code yay and then we, I got a whole lot of emails with questions uh, um, asking for the clarification of the coding implementation because um, uh, the or the, because the original uh, coding guideline about OER code I uh, didn't say anything about uh, didn't give specific information about how it has to be implemented so I realized, that, oh, <laughs> so there has to be a system-wide conversation um, in a very transparent and detailed way. So we sent out a system-wide survey to all faculty members and staff in our system asking for their input on the name of the code, description of the code, and uh, detailed criteria of the code that will be added to the coding manual. So I, that, so I received a, a, I received an incredible huge number of responses from faculty members through that survey. And um, based on the survey, based on the feedback, um, based on the survey feedback, we updated the coding uh, manual. Uh, we updated the OER coding um, implementation guideline in the coding manual. And then um, after that, um, that was 2016. And 2017, during the legislative session, a law passed that support the use of open OER coding. So it wasn't intentional, but it happened. So OER code has been now OER code has been refined through statewide faculty survey. Uh, now there is a supporting law. So OER code was really well established and everybody felt clear about how it needs to be implemented. But then um, during the OER coding uh, survey and um, during the implementation, I received this very consistent feedback from our faculty members saying that, you know, there has to be another code that would mark other affordable, that would mark the courses that use other affordable materials, um, you know, like library resources or other really inexpensive commercial textbooks. Um, and then though, you know, while those do not fit into the traditional technical definition of open educational resources, because they are fully copyrighted with all rights reserved. So you cannot remix and share. So they are not really OER. However, they do offer um, really affordable options for our students. Therefore, they need to be marked, tagged, and should be informed to our students so that our students will be able to make more informed choices. So we got the enough feedback about the need of this new code that would mark the courses that use other affordable course materials. So we started that work as a step, at a, as a phase two. But then we faced this challenge immediately, which was about uh, setting the threshold, ceiling, cost ceiling, um, like how low is low enough? Is $50 low enough for college A, but does it have to be 65? How, how about 52? So 
all the all these ideas about where to set the threshold uh, we couldn't get a system-wide consensus and practically we couldn't we we didn't know how where to go how to go about it but then um uh, some of the councils and the commissions that, that we went to to get the com to get the advice advice that uh, Boyang go ask our students ask our our students what is the reasonable uh, the number that they feel comfortable paying for one uh, five credit quarter long course so that was a challenge given and first I thought it's impossible to get the uh, uh, statewide survey with our students because one we don't have authority to direct to make a direct contact with our with our students and two it's just such a daunting task and then um, we connected with uh, Washington's Student Association and um, this textbook affordability has been their legislative, legislative agenda for years so we bonded immediately uh, we, we became best friends immediately and then I went to all of their uh, all of the Washington uh, Washington Community and Technical College Student Association called WAXA. I went to all of the WAXA events and had conversation with the students over and over again and eventually they agreed to be in charge of uh, a student survey um, asking uh, you know seeking students input on that threshold of the low cost, of the low cost coding implementation. So uh, we designed the survey together, but students were uh, completely in charge of the survey distribution. They governed the whole process. They led the process. And um, our student association leaders, they go to the, um, they go to class by class, they go to a school cafeteria, they were standing outside the classroom, or they go to student club days, whole, you know, talking to each student and handing over the iPad. And in the cold weather, because it was close to winter, <laughs> and they collected ten. Uh, they collected five thousand responses. And when we reached the five thousand number, I sent this email to all of the commission and those our commissions and council groups in our system, asking for assistance. Look, our students made uh, raised the number up to five thousand. They need your assistance, and can you reach them out and do something? So, um, a lot of system councils and commissions and task force and groups, they reached out to, they totally rallied and connected to the student association of their college and helped raise the number to 10,000. So, the total number of uh, survey student survey responses at the end was 10,050. I think it would have grow. It would have, it would have been larger number, but we, we had to close the survey at some point to start an analysis. So, um, out of um, ten thousand students' recommendation, we got the threshold ceiling, which was fifty dollars, which was very consistent through all college, almost all colleges in our system. And then with that threshold number, we went to instruction commission, which is a, a group of vice. Uh, uh, we, we, which is a group of a group of uh, VPs of each college in our system, and um, that number got approved from instruction commission, so it became official. But um, but in after all this process, still we just have one threshold of the low cost coding implementation. We don't have anything other than. We didn't have any other information that would support the implementation. We had to set the name, description, and again, criteria. So this time, um, last month in March, we conducted another survey, this time being sent to the faculty members and administrators with this identified $50 threshold, asking for their input on detailed implementation guidelines what's included, what's not included, uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's eligible, what's not eligible, that uh, the long survey was out to faculty members and we received 630 responses. 
and, and which was huge. <laughs> and then, so out of the response from 630 faculty members and staff, we analyzed uh, the feedback and produced a report and modified the draft and just sent that report back to the faculty members this morning. So it's really, pre it's, it's pretty fresh and hot document. And then, um, and, and, and I started receiving a feedback on the second draft again from the faculty members. And from, and then uh, we will finalize this sometime first or second week of May. And after that, this OER coding guideline and locus coding guideline uh, driven by the two, three, four, five rounds of statewide surveys with faculty members, students, and administrators will be added to our coding, uh, coding manual. So that will be sort of the, the end of our two-year journey, but I know that it's not end of the journey. What we, uh, what we accomplish is this uh, detailed coding guidelines agreed by a system, but um, real challenge will start with um, how to help faculty members to properly implement this into their own um, course. So we will have to start having conversation with college to come up with a mechanism that would, that, that's easy for faculty to submit information and easy for administrators to receive information and easy for the rest of the school offices to, 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 to play with the information. So we will get on, we will get on to that work, but um, we feel pretty confident that we can go through the process. Um, and uh, and I, I guess that's where we are. I think your story is, is so unique too because you, know, you are, are so forthcoming about how you weren't necessarily intrinsically motivated right out the gate to mm -hmm. get involved and mm -hmm. actually lead it, which we tend to hear from leaders that did have that intrinsic motivation right from the get-go and, and wanted to get involved. So it's interesting to learn about your uh, Kind of how your feelings have changed and 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 you know especially now that you have so much participation um how successful it's been across the state have you noticed i mean obviously you've changed yourself but have you noticed just since 2010 um a, a shift in 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 faculty response to, to OER oh, adoption? oh absolutely absolutely so um so in 2000 so when we sent out this faculty, statewide faculty survey to get the feedback on OER coding guideline, uh, the, the feedback was detailed, but it was more about questions, uh, confusions, and I could sense the fear and nervousness there um, because it was pretty big, big change. We are going to change the way that courses are being courses will be labeled and have some courses will have more visibility and some courses will have less visibility and it will change the way they teach uh, their pedagogy their teaching practice all mechanism will be changed so I could tell that um, there was a lot of uh, uh, um, you know this uncertain feeling toward this move but um, this time when we sent out this uh, faculty statewide faculty survey on low cost coding. Um, in a way, it's actually a more complicated and complex than OER coding because OER coding is a, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way the idea is simple. Is that OER in nature or not? But low cost can go in, can go, can be dispersed into a hundred different directions, uh, even with the threshold. So I actually expected, um, a lot more, I, 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 my expectation was, I, I ex actually expected that, that the faculty response will be a lot more uh, complex and, and there, I will see a higher level of nervousness, but that was not true at all. Um, I, I wish, I, I'll be happy to share the, actually the survey report with you. Um, out of 630 faculty response for low cost coding guidelines, 95% of the 
of faculty members who, who responded said that they support the move and they they feel they support the move and they would and they like uh, this whole uh, coding uh, coding works to be successful so actually 50 percent of the faculty members uh, were considered the original draft uh, sufficient and complete and only 40 percent uh, felt uh, 40 percent felt that original draft is sufficient and complete, but with some mod modification. And only 5% of the faculty uh, did not agree with um, the original draft that, that I shared through the survey. So with, and then even, and then there, and, and the feedback from the faculty members through this survey, majority of them were uh, sharp, uh, very constructive, insightful, and really kind. <laughs> really kind, uh, started with appreciation for this move, um, but wanted to offer a few critical yet very constructive feedback. And uh, when I reached them out after the survey, um, they offer a further feedback um, and appreciate it about uh, this whole process being transparent. So it has been a really pleasant experience and I felt like now I my, I have this huge allies, a huge network in our system, who are willing to go for this kind of wild and uh, and 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 revolutionary journey with the state board and and I, I just I really felt pretty supported throughout the whole move. That's so great! I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, you mentioned a little bit around some of your next steps for, for course implementation, but I was just curious if there's anything you want to share in terms of what's next for your work and mm, good question. Um, so um, in the uh, my project <laughs> number two in 2018 <laughs> that I had in mind is that so in the state of Washington in, at the state board, which is a state government agency that supports 34 community and technical colleges in our system, um, we have an open licensing policy. Um, actually, we are the first uh, system office who adopted open licensing policy. I think in the in this in the country. Um, so our open licensing policy is really comprehensive that requires everything that comes that ever comes out of our office should be CC by licensed. That's really wild that, that the works include the ones that we produce as a state board employee during the, our official duties and the, the all the deliverables from the grant that we, have, we fund or manage regardless of the funding source and everything that's created by our vendors and contractors as well. So um, this policy was approved actually last year and we had this a fully approved policy, but we couldn't go proactive in terms of um, uh, uh, implementing this policy because uh, because uh, we needed to have this uh, really detailed and comprehensive implementation guide of our open licensing policy, just like this coding policy to make to connect this coding policy into into uh, faculty's real teaching practice. We needed this. We needed to create this mechanism in between to connect to create as a bridge that connects idea to actual practice. And that breach was a coding mechanism. I think we need something like that for the open licensing policy implementation. Um, I know that DOE, Department of Education, has recently, last year, approved a similar open licensing policy for all grants that they uh, that all grants that they manage and offer. So it's kind of similar to what we have. And um, and, and I know that they are also in the process of comp developing an implementation guideline. So um, we are actually in communication. And, and so whatever we develop or they develop, um, we are going to work on it together so that um, it will be consistent and cohesive. So I'm hoping that toward the end of this year, uh, in within our agency, we will have this um, community of practice established where all of the employees feel comfortable 
utilizing, um, will, will feel comfortable implementing open licensing policy in their work where uh, those experienced employees teach those who just enter this era and uh, we constantly question our practice and, uh, and collect our experiences and increase our database and eventually we'll be able to be in complete co in compliance with open licensing policy that we established. So that, that's the goal. That's great. Um, thank you so much. Oh, wow, it's so great to hear um, what, what y'all are doing. And I know many states are looking at how you've articulated your open policy and also uh, it's so great that y'all are sharing uh, a lot of the kind of behind the, the scenes support uh, so that other states can see, you know, what it takes to, to really do this. Um, coming up to the end of the hour, and I just wanted to open it up for any, any final thoughts or questions or comments for Lu Young before we say goodbye. You can put them in chat or feel free to, to chime in here. Um, using your audio and unmute yourself. Um, so final call on that. <laughs> um, and uh, just in the meantime, while we're, uh, while we're waiting um, for anybody to, to chime in any last thoughts or, or, or comments, um, just want to really extend so much gratitude to you, Ryung. I know you're so busy and you have so much going on, but it was just so great to hear your, your perspective. And um, we have one more session left in this series that we uh, are doing for this, um, for this uh, storytelling uh, session that we've been offering the past few weeks. And that's coming up next month. Um, it's going to be May 8th. It's another Tuesday, May 8th at noon Pacific time. And that's going to be um, with Eric Zimmer, who is a technology integrationist and instructional designer in Vermont. And she has been uh, supporting uh, OER adoption virtually through virtual courses that, that faculty and, and educators are, are engaging in. So she brings a unique perspective on the virtual support for, for OER adoption. Um, so yeah, that'll be our, our last of the series, and we hope you all can join us. I'll send a reminder uh, for. Um, but yeah, just want to want to thank everyone so much for joining us here today. And again, Young, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. You. you finally got a chance to share your story. <laughs> and uh, we're just uh, we're just so inspired by your work and really looking forward to seeing what else uh, comes comes of this this great support network that you've created in, in Washington that's inspiring so many other states. So thanks again Thank and you. all and uh, hopefully we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>